Praise God. God bless you. Welcome. What a delight to have you join us tonight for the life of Christ. Let's begin with a word of prayer. And again, I want to thank you for joining us at Antelope Christian Center for our midweek Bible study. If you have a prayer request, maybe a need or something, just simply post it. I just received a phone call to remember Larry and Nancy and your prayers and their family. Just a special request that they have. And there are many, many others. Let us know. Our prayer team is standing by right now online. If you have a need, you let us know. We have a group of 100 people that are prayer warriors. They're intercessors. You let us know what your need is, and they'll bring it before the Lord. Many of them pray and fast a day throughout the week. Let us be a part. Watch God provide a great miracle. Let's pray. Father God, this week our hearts are so touched and moved as we have made a commitment to National Day of Prayer, praying for America every day since Sunday. We have been focusing in on a different area. Today, COVID-19. Every day we have been praying. Some of us have been fasting. And Lord, we pray for our nation this evening. God, that your hand would be upon us, our nation, Lord, we pray for families and needs that they have. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, do great works in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've not yet seen today's devotional, Pray for America, I want to encourage you to do so. I guarantee you, you will be blessed. And I want to invite you to join me tomorrow morning, sunrise, for National Day of Prayer. Pastor Avellano, I give you a special invitation. I'll be departing the church tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. I'll arrive downtown Sacramento at the California State Capitol. I'll begin on the West Steps. I've done it so many times this year. You can join me online. We will be walking we will be listening to worship music, and we will be praying around the grounds, the perimeter of the entire California State Capitol. It's such an honor and privilege to live so close by, and being a intercessor prayer warrior, we want to make this a priority. Again, Pastor Avellano, if you'd like to join me, let me know. I'll pick you up at 5 a.m. tomorrow morning. We'll be back at the church office in a couple of hours. Well, thank you. Now, let's turn to the book of Acts chapter 1 as we are studying the life of Christ. We have been working on being able to post our message study guides. I love to search the scriptures. I love to study the word of God. And tonight I have posted for your benefit our study guide just for this evening. Now our focus is the life of Christ. We begin in Acts chapter 1 as we're looking at the work and the person of the Holy Spirit. Let me review with you very, very quickly. We're going to be lurk looking and studying what it means to wait upon the Lord. We're going to ask the question, why does Jesus command the apostles to wait? We also are going to discover that the waiting room actually is our prayer room. Well, let's begin in Acts chapter 1, verse 2. One, In my book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach. Verse 2, until the day he was taken up to heaven and giving, after giving his chosen apostles, further instruction through the Holy Spirit. 
Now, let's take a look at verse number two. Until the day he was taken up to heaven. When we pass away, our family and our friends will have a memorial service for us. They'll even have a grave site for us. We just had a beautiful service last Monday. It was so special. It was in a chapel. But with Christ, uh, there was no memorial service. Oh, certainly there was a burial and uh, he was sealed inside a tomb. Uh, have you ever been to a funeral? Have you ever been to a celebration of life? Well, think for a moment about Christ. Did they have a funeral service for Jesus? Well, of course, you know, on the third day, he arose from the dead. But look at verse number two very, very carefully. It says, until the day he was taken up to heaven. Now, when you pass away, should the Lord tarry, when I pass away, the moment we pass from this life into eternity, we are instantly in the throne room of God. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, that did not always happen. That only begin to happen with the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He descended into the pit, into death itself, into the innermost parts of the earth, and he set the captive free. Now, during his ministry in his resurrected body, he would be on earth, and we'll discover how long in just one moment, but I want to point out to you that when Jesus finished his public or his personal ministry on earth, he ascended directly into heaven. Because of the King James language, we use the word ascended. Jesus, number one, was raised from the dead. Number two, Jesus ascended into the heavens. Now, let's come back to it again. Until the day Jesus was taken up to heaven, again, that's the ascension, after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time. And he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. He talked to them about the kingdom of God. In verse number three, we discover two very important historical events. First of all, we discover that Jesus remained in his resurrected body for 40 years days. 40 days. 7 times 7, I believe, would be 49. 7 times 6 is 42. For nearly six weeks, Jesus ministered. Now, during this period of time, unlike his public ministry before his death and resurrection, he was teaching in the synagogues, there were miracles, signs, and wonders, but were somewhat limited with the record of what Christ did during these six weeks. He certainly could have done more than what's recorded, but what we do know is that he taught on a single subject, the kingdom of God. Step back with me to the Gospel of Matthew, and you will quickly recall that John the Baptist starts his ministry with speaking about the kingdom of God. And he says, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And Jesus 
when he starts his public ministry after being baptized in water, his message stays the same. Repent, and he teaches on the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, the kingdom of God is at hand. Studying the kingdom of God in the Gospels is essential. If you've never done so, you'll want to join us for our study later on the kingdom of God through the Gospels. It goes on to say in verse number four, once when Jesus was eating with the apostles, he commanded them, saying to them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized you with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. What's the difference? Baptism of water, a confession of your faith. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your heart, in your soul. Jesus dwells within you through the work of the Holy Spirit. It all begins with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking Christ, verse 6, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? This is such a contrast to the teaching of Jesus. For 40 days, he taught on the kingdom of God. And what's one of the final questions that the apostles ask? What about our kingdom? Are you going to restore our kingdom? Of course, they are thinking of an earthly kingdom. Many Christians today are still living like the apostles, looking for a political party or an earthly kingdom. I've got news for you. Jesus' kingdom is much greater than a political party or an earthly kingdom. Look at what Jesus says. The Father alone has the authority to set the dates and the times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. In the Old Testament, we're going to be studying this Sunday morning, searching the scriptures of how the Holy Spirit came upon the prophet, the leader, the king in the Old Testament. Whether you're talking about Samson or David, whether you're talking about a judge or a king, whether you're talking about a leader like Joshua or Moses, we read about the Holy Spirit come, coming upon. And here Jesus says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. We also know, and we're going to study that this Sunday, that the Holy Spirit not only comes upon us, but the Holy Spirit is with us. I don't have time tonight to make the distinction between the two. But when you join us Sunday morning, you'll be learning with us the distinction of God's Spirit coming upon you and God's Spirit being with you. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit actually dwells within you. John chapter 14, Jesus said it. The Holy Spirit is with you, but soon he will be in you. We'll study that this Sunday morning as we look at the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, including Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. 
Lesson number one in our study of Acts 1, the life of Christ tonight, is in the final instructions that Jesus gives to the disciples. He tells them, number one, to wait. To wait. To wait upon the Lord. We're not very good at that. I think it's part of our culture. All you have to do is watch people go through the yellow light. They don't want to hang out for a red light. They don't want to wait. None of us do. It's part of who we are, especially in this generation. Waiting. Waiting is something found from Genesis to Revelation, we can't go seven days a week. We can't go 24 hours a day. I become weary, fatigued, frustrated. And then I begin to do very, very foolish things. Sometimes you find yourself doing things that are very foolish. You act out. You say things you ought not say. You actually do things that later you regret. You make decisions when you're very frustrated and weary when you should not have made those decisions. It all gets back to resting or waiting. Resting in the arms of Jesus. Waiting upon him. Probably one of the best-known scripture verses about waiting is from the prophet in the Old Testament, Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, perhaps you'll recognize this verse. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Don't get ahead of God. Don't get ahead of the Holy Spirit. I get so anxious. I just get so anxious. Monday, I climbed a mountain that was covered with snow and ice. I stood at the base of that mountain, and I was just feeling so stressed as I looked at how far away it was and how high it was. A couple miles and several thousand feet, nearly 10,000 feet, covered with ice. Oh my, I just thought I'm never going to make it up that. Well, in my situation, I discovered to keep my head down. One of the secrets I have of climbing peaks, mountains, high mountains in the high Sierra, is I don't look up. I keep my head down. I take it one step at a time, and pretty soon, I'm on top of that peak. You know, that lesson about mountaineering and climbing mountains and peaks is a good lesson about waiting upon the Lord. Sometimes you need to keep your head down. Don't try to live tomorrow. Don't worry about all the things that's going to happen tomorrow. When I'm standing at the base of a mountain at a trailhead and I look way up there, I go, there's no way I can do that. But when you put your head down, when you look at what you have in front of you, instead of so far out, and of course, weighing upon the Lord means that our head is down and we're waiting for him. Perhaps one of the most famous stories about somebody that didn't wait would be Abraham and Sarah. God told them what to do, but they got ahead of God. And how did that work out? Catastrophic. Oh, to wait. Wait. God will give you a word in your heart. God gives me words. And I want so much for that to be fulfilled. But I have to wait. Wait a week, a month, a year. Sometimes you wait many, many years. Oh, but waiting on the Lord has such great reward. 
because God's promise is going to be fulfilled. Now, in this story of the life of Christ and the final instructions Jesus gives to the apostles, they do not know how long they're going to have to wait. And that's great insight in our study because they make a commitment to wait upon the Lord and to pray and to seek his face. And the reward is the fulfillment of God's promise. Don't worry about how long you wait. Waiting will see the fulfillment of God's vision God's dream, God's promise in your life. Oh, consider Joseph, who was 17 years old, and God gave him a dream. Everything happened in the book of Genesis, just like the dream was. Oh, to wait. Caleb and Joshua, they were the only two spies, and they waited 40 years. They believed in God's promise. The other 10 spies didn't. But when you read through the book of Joshua, you see waiting 40 years paid big dividends in their lives. In this story, they're told to wait. And the Bible says, they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. In Luke chapter 24, verse 49, Jesus said, I will send the promise of the Father upon you. But tarry, this is King James. I love King James language. Tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Well, when we read through this story tonight, we're going to discover that the apostles did exactly what Jesus said. And the fulfillment was God poured out his spirit. Verse 9, after saying this, Jesus was taken up into a cloud while well, they were watching, Jesus ascended into the clouds to heaven, right in front of the eyewitnesses. They'll later tell the story. They saw Jesus ascend to the heavens. They could no longer see him. He got smaller and smaller the higher he went until finally their eyes could not focus. Jesus ascended into heaven. And they strained their eyes to see Jesus ascend into heaven, rise into heaven. And there were angels, two white-robed men. Suddenly they stood among the apostles and they spoke. Men of Galilee, why are you standing here? Staring into the heavens, Jesus has been taken from you into heaven. But someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go up. Oh, that's a glorious story. The resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, don't you just love the story of the resurrection? But remember, the ascension. Now, sometimes people get confused because they know Jesus was risen from the dead and they know Jesus ascended into heaven. What they don't recall, because they don't read it, is that there was nearly six weeks be between the resurrection and the ascension. And sometimes in your life, that's what waiting is all about. Remember, the body of Christ laid in the tomb for three days. Remember, Jesus waited 40 days before he ascended. 
never get discouraged when things don't work out with your time clock because we're not using your earthly time clock. We're using the Heavenly Father's time. And sometimes that's tough. If you recall the passage of Scripture, a thousand years is like a day for the Lord. Don't become impatient. It'll rob you of your joy. It'll cause you to make terrible choices. Be patient. Wait on the Lord. He'll renew your strength. You'll mount up with wings like eagles. Well, the waiting room turns out to be a prayer room. When my first son was born, occasionally I was with my wife in the delivery room, but the doctor or the nurse would say, Sir, you need to step outside for just a few minutes. I never liked that. I wanted to be with my wife. But they sent me to the waiting room. And they said, you wait here. And when she's ready, we'll give you a call. And I would go out there and I was so nervous. In fact, all the future fathers I saw in the waiting room had one thing in common. They were very, very nervous. It's not easy being in the waiting room, but it's important. Let me say that to you again. It is not easy being in the waiting room, but it's very, very important. Don't. Be like Abraham and Sarah and get ahead of God. Take a deep breath and say, Lord, I want your plan. I want your purpose. I want your will. Look at what happens in verse 10. Jesus goes to heaven and the apostles return to the upper room. Then the apostles return to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives a distance of about a half mile. When they arrived, they went to the upstairs room of the house where they were staying. They went to the upper room. The waiting room is the prayer room. And for the next 10 days, until the day of Pentecost, and here on my wall, I have a plaque that was gifted me. It says Pentecost. Between the day that Jesus went to heaven and the day of Pentecost would be 10 days. They were in a prayer meeting for 10 days. Let's read about it. When they arrived, they went to the upstairs room of the house where they were staying. They all met together and were constantly united in prayer. It's just incredible what we learn in this passage of Scripture. We learn that they were obedient. They were told to wait, and they did. We learn that they were together. Jesus practiced personal prayer, but he also said, where two or three are gathered, there I am in your midst. And what you bind on earth is bound in heaven. How? By agreement. It's praying in unity. And what we see happening in the waiting room is we discover united prayer. Tomorrow is National Day of Prayer. If you join me on social media, at sunrise, I'll be at the state capitol representing you. I'm doing it online for you, that you might participate, that we might together make this journey all the way around the state capitol in unity. There is power in prayer that has unity. There is weakness in prayer that has 
division or discord. There is strength and there is power when we agree in the name of Jesus. What we find as we search the scriptures together is we find these apostles being obedient to Christ, going and waiting in the prayer room, and being united in prayer. And lastly, we discover that their prayer has no end. They are constantly praying. Look at verse 14 one more time. They all met together, all of them, and were constantly united in prayer. During this time, when about 120 people were together in one place, Peter's going to stand up and speak to them. Oh, glory, glory to God. They are united they're praying together. Those 12, one drifted. Judas. So now there's 11. Jesus ascends to be with the Father, and these 11 are being obedient, and they're being faithful, and they're being united in prayer. And quickly, the 11 become. 120, and they never give up. They never give up. And they're committed, consecrated, praying and praying and praying. And of course, on the day of Pentecost, the power from on high falls, and they're all baptized in the Holy Spirit. Father God, we bow our hearts. Oh, that Jesus would be our personal Savior and the Lord of our lives. Lord, that we would be baptized in the Holy Spirit and, and that we would be filled and be ye being filled with the Holy Spirit. Bless your word to our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning at sunrise as we march, representing you, around the state capitol, praying for America. Oh, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May God's face shine upon you. May God's grace go before you. May your heart be filled with peace. May your day be blessed as you walk with Jesus. God bless you. Thank you for being with us tonight right here at Antelope Christian Center for our midweek Bible study, The Life of Christ. Be blessed.